Well, take three. Last night I recorded this and just right at the end the microphone failed. This morning I recorded it and this time I had a different micro in the microphone in my hand and I accidentally pressed the stop mute button halfway through and it failed again. So I've, I've almost recorded this whole lecture three times. So hopefully this will be smooth and without any errors uh, or slightly me looking and sounding bored with the content. All right, organizational structure. Um, it is actually somewhat a boring um, element of um, organizational behavior, considering that organizational behavior is about that fleshy, flesh and blood, angst, stress and strain kind of elements of performance within organizations, the human, the human factor. And um, organizational structure is actually the structural factors that impact upon the humans. Um, I well remember that um, my dad, who was a mechanical engineer, perhaps that says it all, uh, used to have a whiteboard or even on paper he used to draft um, structures of the organization uh, of his business, you know, and he, you know, map who was in charge of what, the different divisions with, within the, within the, um, the factory, uh, and how they all interrelated with each other. Uh, this is typically a characteristic of larger firms, as we'll see, um, but this organizational chart um, mentality is very much keyed in to what we're talking about in organizational structure, so that's a good way. I'm sure the computer is not going to misbehave. All right, let's dive into it. Now, so organizational structures, how tasks are formally divided, clustered, coordinated, and delegated within the organization, uh, and can relate to communication patterns, um, you know, workflow patterns, uh, anything that's designed to direct um, how an organization runs or how its activities flow through the organization. We're going to look at these um, six different characteristics initially. Uh, initially, we'll have a look at work specialization, so I won't say too much about this, but, but departmentalization is where you break it up into things like you know, department of accounts, accounts department, design department, and so on. Formalization, where we'll talk about bureaucracy. Decentralization, uh, which I don't think is the right term for what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about divisional structures within organisations. Um, spans of control, quite a key, uh, key thing relating to how much control each manager has. And command structures, how they differ, um, different characteristics of, of command structures and the implications for the organization. But first, I want to have a look at this issue of work specialization, which is a really good place to start, because it looks at how you break up um, break up organizations and break up the work that actually gets done. And if you think about an organization, particularly businesses, it's surely about the end product. How you produce the end product is really the core of an organization. And this issue of specialization is something that has developed a lot over the last uh, century, uh, century and a half. Now, the traditional way of um, doing things within organizations, and I'll switch this uh, YouTube video on. The traditional way of doing things was a little bit like this, holistically working on a car, you know, um, all the components, notice these guys are all standing around working on all different components. The wheels are going to be added. Um, and probably one guy did multiple tasks. They were very broadly skilled um, artisans. For example, you'd have people making the whole of that wheel there, um, or a panel beater doing all the panels. That was the traditional way of manufacturing or um, trade within um, uh, human history. But Henry Ford, this chap, came along and revolutionized it in a couple of ways. Um, the first way that he revolutionized it, it was in, in recognizing that he needed to produce a cheap car, such as the Model T, he decided he needed to speed up the process of manufacturing. And he sped it up rapidly by relying uh, on a particular theorist who was just starting to influence uh, the nature of work at that stage, um, called Taylor, Winslow Taylor, I think from memory. Don't take my word for it. Winslow, sorry, Taylor. And he you know, gave his name to a process or an approach to work called Taylorism, um, which is controversial, but 
very, very prevalent today. Um, and he broke up, he looked, he used the clock, and he broke up activities by looking at each activity holistically and in its components, uh, breaking down, for example, in the, in the nature of a typist, which we'll see uh, in a moment, you know, breaking down the, the movement of the carriage return, for those of you who can remember when old manual typewriters were in place, the inserting of the paper, the rolling of the paper, the putting the carbon paper in, the pulling it out, uh, all the different processes involved with typing, for example. Here's the example coming up. And he assisted this lady, who was at that stage the world record holder for the fastest typist, to uh, develop even faster pace of doing a, a task by looking at the different components and looking for efficiencies. But there was a second way that Taylor influenced work. So traditionally, when you made a wheel, you made the whole wheel. A wheelwright would take, let's say, that was what they called that profession, a wheelwright, would take maybe a three-year apprenticeship apprenticeship to develop the kind of skill and facility to make a whole wheel or something similar. These guys were probably trained for a matter of sh few days maximum to reach optimal kind of speeds. They used automation as we can see here, but the other element is, look, he hasn't even finished the wheel. He passes it on to a more skilled person who does the other parts of the wheel. Everyone does a little bit. So you can develop a great deal of skill by doing a little bit. And the other thing, remember when we talked about motivation, when you drive people to do simple tasks, in, in, um, when you pressure them or reward them to do simple tasks, their speed will go up. But with complex tasks, if you push people too hard, their speed will go down at a certain point because they'll get nervous and stressed and that adrenaline doesn't work well, that, that stress doesn't work well with complex tasks. Now the second thing that Ford introduced, which was a Ford innovation rather than a Taylor innovation, was the concept of the conveyor belt system. Now traditionally, when a car was built, the car was built by all these different guys gathering around a chassis and putting the bits on and polishing and finishing it off and rolling it out. But here, this is a, a bit of a reenactment of what took place, Ford moved the chassis to the guys. So mountain to Muhammad rather than Muhammad to the mountain, as we say in English expression. So what happened here was that the, the pace with which workers worked was dictated by the speed of the machine. Uh, and everybody did that single task and they didn't have to move even. This resulted in what we call work intensification. Work intensification means uh, that you know you are under a lot more pressure, you, your time is filled very precisely, measured precisely, and performance and um, efficiency and productivity, of course, do go up, but at what cost? The cost is stress and also lack of sense of autonomy, lack of sense of self-efficacy, um, lack of control within the workplace. And these are all things that are related with stress and bad, lowered job satisfaction, greater staff turnover, um, and health issues, well-being issues. Now, Ford dealt with this problem very effectively by literally doubling wages. And um, where he was getting a great deal of staff turnover in these um, early days of introducing this kind of automation and this kind of um, uh, um, elevator um, conveyor belt type of system, uh, once he doubled the wages, there was a lot less complaint within the Ford motor, motor factory. I mean, people just tolerated it just for the great wages that they could get relative to the wages of the time. Now, the advantages of dividing or specialising labour up this way is it increases efficiency, improves manageability um, for the managers. Instead of being a manager of, you know, uh, a whole motoring division, you're a manager of putting the wheels on division. You've got five guys doing that. You can, you, you yourself, not only do they need less expertise, and less training, but you also need less training to be able to effectively manage that. And it allows staff, in theory, to become very, very good at things, but very, very good at very small things. But the negative side, of course, as we say, is that, you know, on the positive productivity can go up, but there comes a point where the human factor kicks in and people rebel against it. And in motor companies these days, we, we do see a return to the pre-Ford era to some degree. Some of the, the good brands, uh, the better brands, you know, the BMWs, the Audis, Rolls Royces, that type of thing, they do have that holistic attitude to car making that's come back in again um, to give people a sense of, um, of um, 
value for their work and a sense of um, control and a sense of uh, they conceptualize their work holistically as opposed to this atomistic uh, tiny focus that causes um, stress and lack of meaning in work. Okay, this issue of decentralization, I prefer to, to look at this as divisionalization of, of companies. Um, and it can be divisionalized by, you know, customer. Just ignore the fact I've got customer there and twice. But so, for example, you know, Ford Motor Company these days will have a division that is focused on the, supplying the US government or the Australian government with, you know, cars for um, politicians to drive around in or other bureaucrats. Um, it could have a product focus. Similarly, Ford might have a truck division, a, um, a SUV division, and a, um, a car division. Or it could be focused into geography. So you may well have, um, you know, like a, a North American uh, section of, of, the, of a company, like um, regardless whether it's Sony or, or Nestle. Uh, or it could be break, broken down into functions, for example, architectural, etc., uh, or design, or um, different kinds of functions like that. All right. Command structures. This is not complicated. Chains of command, like a chain, one chain is linked to the other, and that particular link is not linked to two chains down, just to the next chain down. These unbroken lines of command are typical of um, what we call uh, mechanistic structures, and we're going to be talking about that in uh, shortly. Um, a good example of such a structure would be uh, the army, where you've got the general at the top, the private at the bottom, and commands are issued down the chain in a quite um, rigid, um, non-flexible manner through that unbroken line chain of command. Authority, for those of you familiar with the dictionary in English, you'll be aware that that's what it means, you know, the power invested, the authority to make decisions. Um, and that can be um, people who make decisions or actually carry out decisions might be very different to the people who authorise them to make that de de decision. Unity of command, this concept of answering as in the chain of command to a single person, but in reality it doesn't work that way as we'll see uh, shortly. But you know, in my case, for example, I've got many different potential bosses, and in reality they probably are true. I, ha I answer to the Dean of Business, and I probably regard him as my main boss, but I've also got um, departmental heads who I also answer to, um, and local here on the campus I've got certain higher ranking people such as the Deputy Dean of, uh, of um, Teaching and Learning who I take advice from or take suggestions from and then of course ultimately there's the Vice Chancellor of CQU who if he gave me a direct order I'd be very inclined to do as I'm told. Now that's typical of, of the nature of a modern organisation. There is not this concept of unity of command. There is in some organisations but increasingly not so. Spans of control, important concept. Um, span talks to you know the width or the or, or the, the range of control, and you can either have this wide uh, span of control or a narrow span of control, uh, and that relates to the amount of people that you as a manager have under your command, um, under your leadership. Now, having a wide uh, span of control inevitably increases efficiency. That means the organisation has less fat in it. Um, whereas narrow span of control, it, um, it does add extra dollars to the cost, the labour cost of an organisation because you've got more managers and middle managers um, in that structure. Uh, to less people producing that product, whatever it is that comes out the end, whether product or service, I still think of it in terms of an output. Uh, and also, this narrow spans of control tend to introduce the concept of micromanagement, um, where you've got a supervisor closely supervising uh, what you're doing, and it reduces that sense of autonomy and control. But it may suit certain types of tasks, for example, um, particularly complex task with inexperienced staff, you may well need a narrow span of control. And, you know, this is just a visual. As you can see, 
circumstance like this, which is this flat structure, as opposed to this relatively taller structure. Um, they're, they're commonly, the, the, the textbook refers to this top structure here as being a simple structure. One manager, heaps of grassroots staff, and this is more a typical managerial structure, a typical organisational chart where there is this vertical nature to the chart and you've got a lot of middle managers here populating the, the chart. Formalisation, um, we'll be talking about bureaucracy uh, a little bit, but you know this formalisation relates to how organisations, particularly larger organisations, start to introduce rules and policies, laws and regulations. Um, it's an inevitable, almost inevitable process. Um, it reduces um, flexibility and autonomy of an organisation. Um, and so you do get, um, within companies, more formal components and less formal components, but it is a progression that most companies go through. Departmentalisation is also something that tends to happen. So when a company starts, it tends to be this kind of simple structure, one boss, many staff, and then it begins to progress into this functional structure um, where employees begin to sort around specific skills or tasks or resources. Um, for example, you know, you start to get design departments and you start to get specialised designers within an organisation. Uh, when I started my newspaper, for example, um, I, um, I used to do everything from sell, I hated selling, but I did sell advertising in the paper, all the way through to writing articles, laying out articles, uh, delivering the, the, the um, copy to the press. Um, I didn't do the printing. Um, but I did help fold the papers and deliver the papers on the first few editions when we were starting out. That's what I, I did all of those things. We had a staff of two, realistically, just my wife and I, uh, and, um, and that's how the, the, the business developed. Uh, but as we grew, it's, we, I started to specialise in writing um, and design of the... Um, and I probably saw myself at that stage more as a newspaper editor or journalist. And this is this process of professionalisation or specialisation. And what that does, in certain circumstances, as an owner of the organisation, co-owner, I had still got that, had that whole of organisation focus. But with this functional uh, development that happens to businesses, this functional specialisation, of course, people start to focus on their own little patch, their own little silo, to use the language uh, that, that we use in organisational behaviour. The silo con concept of being, I only focus on the, the what's around me and don't think about the, the ultimate aim of an organisation, a business anyway, which is to make a profit and survive and thrive. You get this divisional structure then develops quite commonly and we've talked about that. And finally, I just want to mention what we call virtual structures in the textbook or network structures is, is another term that we use for it, where it's an increasingly common modern solution to organisational structures as not just people within organisations begin to specialise, but organisations themselves find that become very good at doing one thing and rather than try and be um, a master of many trades, become a master of one. Now a great example of this is Paul Newman's own brand of um, pasta sauces, sauces that you'll see in Woolworths and Coles across Australia. Um, these are come to you and are spread all over the world via the courtesy of really 28 core employees, which is extraordinarily small. And if you think about that, even the sales function of Paul Newman's own must logically not be within the company of Paul Newman's own. It would be probably farmed out, but the bottle making is farmed out, the tomato growing is farmed out, the tomato squashing and, uh, and combining with garlic and, and other uh, herbs will be farmed out. The putting the label onto the bottle is farmed out. Everything is farmed out except possibly that core administration and perhaps a bit of decision making at a macro level is farmed out. So that this massive conglomerate is actually a tiny little conglomerate with all this network of other companies attached to it through contract. It's very, very flexible. Uh, it allows companies quickly to change to new tastes in the market um, or trends. It allows them to adopt new partners when one drops away or one offers a cheaper price than another. Um, you don't have to invest as much. 
you can imagine why this is becoming popular, and you have less infrastructure in, in order for, to follow a particular path. Now, on the negative side, it does expose a company to supply side, side risks, what we call supply side risks. So, for example, if you're a bottle maker, if you're um, or Newman's own, if your bottle maker is manufacturing something and they have a flood uh, or a strike or they go broke through poor management and you've got no control over these things, you suddenly are in big trouble. You can't produce the product that you have to produce, which means you either have to switch suppliers, which may not be contractually or feasible or in other ways, and you can't control these issues. You don't have them in-house anymore. But um, there is also, the textbook doesn't refer to this, but there is also an, a flip side to this. As one of these suppliers to Paul Newman's own, I've been in that position myself. And, for example, the bottle maker doesn't have much skin in the game. It's producing bottles, bottles, bottles of a generic sort for the company. But... Paul Newman's got the flexibility to choose another bottle manufacturer who's five cents cheaper, form a contract with them, and then all the work you've put into developing that relationship is lost. So the example that um, happened in my life was where my, my dad's company, which I was involved with at that time, was um, producing a particular product for a national retailer. And they put their brand on it. They even supplied the label and they put the packet, supplied the packet. We simply made a very good quantity, quality product in large quantities for them at a decent price, supplied it, supplied it, supplied it. That brand then attached to that quality, but at a certain stage that company chose to ditch us and go with another supplier and all the effort that we'd put into the quality of that product suddenly was switched to um, another supplier and we lost that contract uh, and our reputation was attached to someone else's product and we we were left in, in, in you know, a very difficult situation as a result of that. So let's have a look at some common organisational designs, um, starting off with what the textbook calls flat structures, which are, you know, manager with heaps of people underneath it. Um, the textbook, sorry, calls it simple structures, but more commonly these are called flat structures as opposed to tall structures. They tend to be not formal, they tend to be centralised, they tend not to have departments, as you can see, a single, everyone's a little bit of a multitasker within that kind of structure, and obviously a wide span of control. I won't show you that, funny as it is. Now, bureaucratic structures, you're probably familiar with the idea of red tape. Uh, most countries have got it, some countries have got it worse than others. Um, but bureaucratic structures tend to be very specialised, formalised, departmentalised. They tend to follow a strict chain of command, lots of paperwork, lots of auditing, checking, documenting of behaviours, and also this concept of narrow spans of control. There's something about bureaucratic structures that um, almost seem to breed narrow spans of control. So, for example, universities are typical of this kind of bureaucratic structure. Um, a university, typically in Australia, has produces two products. It produces teaching for students like yourself, and it produces research for the broader community, in theory anyway. Those are the two products we produce, but fully 50% of the staff at a university commonly are merely administrators. So you've got 50% of the staff producing the product and 50% of staff supposedly supporting the people who produce the product. But that's not really how it works because this is not the nature of bureaucracy. Um, because you may surprise you that that 50% of the people who actually produce the product probably spend as much as 20 to 30% of their time, according to studies I've been involved with, um, pr producing also paperwork. So you got 50% plus a further 30% um, of the other 50%, which is another 15%, so 65% of the time, which is fully two-thirds of the time spent on paperwork and administration, and 35% of the time on delivering of the product, which is extraordinarily inefficient. Bureaucracy, of course, has these positives. It's reliable. It's... Um, 
it, it's uh, on the negative side, yeah, but on the positive side, it's reliable, it's centralised, clear, it allows the central vision of an organisation to be reliably transmitted through the organisation. It does tend to somewhat minimise duplication. But it also has uh, the seeds of destruction built in, you could say, because organisations, you get paid by how much span of control you have, in, in short. As a manager, if you've got 500 people underneath you directly and indirectly, you'll get more money per year than if you've got 20 people underneath you. And you get these processes whereby um, one particular piece process then gets audited properly and there needs to be a form for it. Then there needs to be someone who designs the form, delivers the form, checks that the form has been filled in. It breeds itself. So red tape. Um, has that function or that weakness. Matrix structure, you know how I talked about unity of command before? The matrix structure is um, a very good example of how it doesn't work always. So matrix structures involve this dual functional and product focus. Take a, the example I use in class was a computer game manufacturer producing two products, uh, War of Warcraft and the Dark and the Deep, for example. Um, now, the War of Warcraft and Dark and the Deep both have a manager handling their product. I don't even know if Dark and the Deep is a real computer game. I've heard of War of Warcraft. I don't do any gaming. Um, so there's a manager for each product. So that's a product departmentalization. But on the horizontal level, each of these two products requires a, a team of designers, a team of programmers, a team of sales staff, a team of graphic people. And they'll, each of those divisions on a horizontal level have got, so there's a, design, a software manager of the software department, a design manager of the designer de design department. So effectively, people in the design department in the dark and the deep um, have a boss in charge of the product and a boss in charge of their function within the organisation, which is as a, a, a manager of design. So you answer to uh, two different bosses and that can cause conflict and confusion, uh, but it also is a very flexible kind of system, which is relatively easy to conceptualise um, and allows people to be assigned horizontally across different products quite easily. Now, we talked already about the network or virtual um, organisation, the Paul Newman example, so we'll move on from that. I, I mentioned mechanistic and organic before, and I'll just quickly talk about this. Mechanistic organisations are at one extreme of organisational design, and they tend to be high on departmentalisation, specialisation, rigidity, and command structures. So they're more rigid, fixed organisations, as well as centralised power and formalised. The organic structures at the other extreme, and you get these situations that are much more complex and much less uh, easy to put on a chart, for example. So within a single team, you can have people work on many different functions. Or within a single team, rather than having a unified team of all designers, for example, working together, you can have design managers and different kinds of levels of hierarchy within the one team. Um, and it tends to be very free and easy, laissez-faire with information flow. It tends to be highly decentralised form of power, these, uh, and of course informal, and wider spans of control. So remember those two, organic versus mechanistic. The boundaryless organisation is something I don't really believe exists too much, but the textbook has this nice quote from the General Electric chairman, big multinational Jack Welsh, uh, saying his dream for the company is to create the sense that GE is like a great family store, uh, which I, to which I reply, dream on. But theoretically, these organisations have no chain of command, they have limitless spans of control, they have few vertical ceilings that stop people rising or information falling and rising. Little status and rank and hierarchy is embedded in this kind of organisation and has you know, geographical borders. Um, I can't imagine an organisation that's quite like this. Okay, let's have a look at some reasons why uh, organisations tend to, their structures differ. First of all, let's have a look at um, size. Now, I've already referred to the fact that as organisations grow, a degree of um, certain changes become almost inevitable, almost universal. There's always exceptions to every rule. But they do tend to become more mechanistic, 
functions become more specialized, they tend to create more bureaucracy built into the system, and they tend to become more formal. These are almost inevitable consequences of growth of size of an organization. And if you're a manager, think about it. You can have, um, you can personally be involved in a small organization with the recruitment of every new staff, but there'll come a time when you simply don't have the time, and you'll need to delegate that to a person who will become the HR manager whatever and gets involved with recruitment processes and it's all begun at that stage you start to create divisions and specializations and there'll be forms to make sure these things have been done whether you know for example dispatch and receipt of uh, product into the thing needs to be documented because you can't keep it all in your head so size is one of those contingencies that change an organization technology is another good example the way you need to think about this is that Technology determines certain aspects of your organization. Now, for example, the Ford Motor Factory, um, it's inevitable uh, once you have that high infrastructure investment in mechanization that you need to make sure the machine is kept happy because the machine starts to become more important and more valuable for the organization than the people almost who are expendable and replaceable. Um, so that's one example, but there's also a degree to which technology can facilitate changes within the organization. Now, in the era of email and Skype, for example, we can have organizations that are spread worldwide and have very fast, flexible manners of communication that were not possible in the days of the first fleet and the uh, parcels that would take 12 months to get delivered with orders from Britain to Australia, for example. And this characteristic of the environment that can change, um, you know, environment can become highly volatile or simple, etc. Um, effectively, what this means is that if you're in an environment that's, that is very dynamic, you need to have more flexible structures. Or if you're in um, an uh, environment that's highly complex, you need to be able to re respond to that. Um, you know, as the textbook points out, um, I don't think I've drawn those arrows correctly, but as the textbook points out, the environments can um, vary along a number of dimensions, from simple to complex, from abundant to scarce, when things are getting tight, uh, and from stable to dynamic. And these things create um, a, a difference in um, what you can do with your organisation. Particularly, think about the example, the military example again, that when you're in a uh, position of um, being under fire, you can't dilly-dally about team structures and let's have a vote on this, etc. which is why you have that direct, inviolable command structure, unity of command in the army quite often, because it needs it for that wartime uh, stress. In a broad sense, this phrase, structure follows strategy, I think is a really good way to think about um, uh, this issue of when you're a manager choosing what kind of structure you will implement within an organization. And you get these questions, um, these different strategies, sorry, that a company can take. I mean, three of the most common ones are innovation, you know, where you're all about being new or first to the market with something, uh, or creating a variety of different products rather than just focusing on one kind of product, starter motors, for example, or door handles. Cost minimalization, quite obvious, trying to be the cheapest in the market, or imitation, which combines elements of being cheap and elements of me tooism, as we say, which helps you to be cheap. And I've just used three logos here, which are kind of illustrative of those three different strategies. Now, if you want to take, for example, the, the idea of cost minimalization as your um, as your strategy, the one that you choose for your for your company, then you need to have processes that minimize the cost of labor. So you may well want to reduce your bureaucracy. You may well, well want to have a wider span of control. You may well want to have specialization, high degree of specialization, and a high degree of mechanization of product. Um, or you may well choose, um, uh, if your cost minimization is your focus, you may well choose to find specialist suppliers of products that can produce it cheaper than you could ever hope to produce it. So you may well choose that virtual structure. So these are 
structure does follow the strategy that the, that the manager picks for the company. Okay, some overall findings as we wrap it up. So one finding is that participative decision making, where you get people involved, is positively related to job satisfaction for all the reasons that you've learnt in the last uh, 10 weeks of this um, 10 weeks of this of this course which is you know participative decision making it doesn't suit everybody but uh, it does make people feel more involved and engaged it gives people a greater sense of um, uh, self-efficacy a, a greater sense of um, participation within processes uh, and ownership Span of control is an interesting one. Then the impact of span of control on performance is based on a number of things, including individual difference uh, and abilities, the task structure, organisational focus. So just to quickly illustrate, um, let's have a look at individual differences. You may have st or individuals and differences and abilities. We'll, we'll package them together. You may well have someone who is um, disengaged at work, doesn't what just is a nine to fiver, very new to a particular skill, um, doesn't focus at work, and doesn't have a great deal of ability at work. Um, so you can still handle that kind of staff member, but they probably need to be micromanaged and given simple tasks. So you probably need a narrower span of control for people of that characteristic. But if a task is complex and involves someone with um, high skill and great deal of self-drive, self-leadership, then you may well be able to use a wider span of control. Specialisation, this process of specialisation has, um, has produced less um, benefits over the last century. When Ford introduced it, massive, massive increase in speed of producing cars, for example. But now, as I said before, employees are increasingly seeking jobs that have this kind of sense of reward in them. And as a result, um, companies, including car makers, are moving to jobs that have this kind of holistic sense where you can see what you're producing um, and feel pride in what you're producing. Worker specialisation does reduce job satisfaction. It does, of course, increase productivity. And people tend to seek out and stay at organisations that match their needs. Um, so you can actually recruit by advertising the kind of company you are, like Google tries to do this, but many other companies have this kind of reputation that attracts people. So just keep in mind, I've got that, and I think I think we're done. I'm just checking quickly. Yeah, okay, we're all good. 37 minutes, and I can tell that this is a success. So uh, we'll see you next week for the very final week uh, of the course. Um, I've really enjoyed the process. I'm getting to the stage, sore throat and... Uh, weariness but um, I hope uh, I hope you've enjoyed it too now um, do stay in touch uh, if uh, you're not getting your assignments back uh, on time or there are any other issues in the run-up to the exam do let me know and I'll try and respond as quickly as possible indeed I've got quite a few emails in my inbox right now which I'll be attending to shortly thanks